tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Mint Mobile. Imagine all of the horrific scenarios to find yourself in without a cell phone. From needing to call 911 due to a terrifying emergency, to calling home to check in with the babysitter on your first night out alone, to needing the comfort of Google Maps to take you to unfamiliar places, having your phone with you is safer and makes things plain easier. Or even worse, you have a phone, but you can't keep hold of the signal, rendering it practically useless. Do you know how much utter peril you can avoid by having affordable and reliable phone service? That's where Mint Mobile comes in. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. Also by going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. It gets even better. I was even able to use my own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep my same phone number along with all my existing contacts. Saving me the time and trouble of texting everyone individually on my contacts list to alert them of a number change. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free, no waiting in long lines at a cellular store, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark <laughs> good evening you're listening to scary stories told in the dark welcome listeners to season 10 episode 16 i'm your host otis jerry and in this episode I'll be performing three tales to terrify you by author Joseph Sinamo about a barren artisan's Icarus embodiments and repulsive rituals. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first spine-tingling story. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> I'm sure you all know the phrase, beauty is only skin deep. Of course you do. 
It's the phrase every horror story uses before talking about something revolting and unpleasant. And, well, folks, tonight's no exception. In this tale from J.M. Simano, we join two federal agents hot on the trail of a strange killer with some interesting habits. But more worrying is not what the killer is doing, but why. Without further ado, I present to you Ideal Beauty. Dusk had only just settled over the vacant crop fields of Goochland County, a vast rural farming area just west of Richmond, Virginia. The sky was bruised in shades of burnt orange near the horizon that bled into deep reds, purples, and blacks as the sun continued to sink with each passing moment. On any other night, this would have been the start of an ideal summer evening for this normally serene area. Unfortunately, Special Agent Lowell knew this would be no ordinary evening, as he and his partner raced down Route 6 toward their latest assignment. Tell me, how can it be this goddamn hot with the sun almost all the way down? groaned Evans, Lowell's partner for the past five years. I mean, you're not even that far south. Lowell chuckled as Evans dabbed the sweat from his forehead with his necktie and adjusted the AC vent to blow directly in his face. So what's the word? Heard you were supposed to fill me in on the way to the scene. Lowell peered out the driver's side window with his steel blue eyes and watched the long shadows of the neighboring forest smear across the painted sky. A couple of kids were out here in the countryside firing a potato gun at the windows of an abandoned barn just off the main stretch here. One of the kids decided to look through the broken windows and found it to be not so abandoned after all. Local PD was called in, but they phoned us. They think it might be another one. They said they preserved the scene and haven't touched anything. The local contact, someone named Danvers, I think, said he wants us to look over the scene with his CS team. We'll know more once we get there. Potato gun. Evans mused aloud. The hell is a potato gun? Lowell chuckled again. <laughs> some cobbled together PVC pipes, a potato, some hairspray, and an igniter. Heard these things can launch a potato over a hundred yards. Could you use other vegetables, like a carrot or an onion? How the hell should I know? Look, we're almost here. I'm gonna need you to talk to the officers that responded to the boys' call. Find out what you can from them and see if any of the boys want to give a statement about what happened. I'll talk to our contact about the situation and anything suspicious that may have happened recently in the area. Then we'll both examine the scene together. Evans nodded that he understood the protocol, then turned his attention to his phone messages. And Evans, Lowell continued, keep the potato gun questions to a minimum, please. Night had finally settled in as the two special agents pulled up to the crime scene. Gone now were the painted skies and endless fields of shadows. Only the hypnotic swirling of red and blue police lights, pierced by long spotlight beams, illuminated the small wooded area, projecting dancing shadows onto the surrounding trees and decrepit barn. As the two agents got out of their vehicle, a local detective hastily approached them from behind a yellow police tape. Special Agent Lowell, Special Agent Evans, thank you for coming out here. On such short notice, got a real mess back there, and, well, I suppose you men would like to have a look for yourselves. Special Agent Lowell gave the young detective a once-over before turning to his partner. Evans, go get statements from the other officers and CSI on the scene, and find out if any of the boys is willing to talk with us tomorrow morning. I'll go with Detective Danvers here and inspect the victim and the barn. Join us when you're ready and bring the CS lead with you. Evans nodded, retrieved his notepad and pen from his pocket, and proceeded toward the other officers and crime scene personnel standing outside of the yellow-taped perimeter. 
Lowell gestured to Detective Danvers to lead the way. Sir, Detective Danvers began as they crossed under the police tape and made their way towards the barn. It's an honor to get to work with you and your partner. When we heard the FBI was sending agents to our podunk little county, we never imagined it to be you and Agent Evans. Agent Lowell gave a brief smile and nodded to show his appreciation. He'd never considered himself and Evans as big names at the FBI, but this latest series of murders and their grotesque tableaus made them household names and regular discussion topics at dinner tables across the Mid-Atlantic region. Even with no major leads or arrests made, in regards to what the news organizations were now calling the Virginia Vampire. Detective Danvers cleared his throat and turned to Special Agent Lowell. Uh, sir, quick question. How did you know my name? I know I was a bit flustered when you arrived, but I don't remember introducing myself. Special Agent Lowell paused at the entrance to the weather-worn barn. Well, I was told I'd be assisted by a Detective Danvers. You matched the description I was given. You were the first person to approach us upon our arrival at the scene. And, well, it's on your nameplate. Lowell tapped the detective's name tag with his pen, and the two men shared a brief chuckle before remembering the grotesque horrors that awaited just beyond the decrepit wooden door that separated them from a waking nightmare. The barn's interior expressed the same stages of decrepitness and disuse as the exteriors had suggested. Broken farm equipment and tools, rusted field implements, decomposing planks and cobwebs adorned every wall and surface not otherwise occupied by the crime scene which stood in the glow of the floodlights like a true-to-life Halloween display. The stench of the place was just as offensive as the sight of it. The mustiness and mildew odors, coupled with the wretch-inducing smell of decay and carnage, left to bake in the Virginia heat was enough to make even the seasoned agent cover his nose and turn his head as the initial wave hit him. The grisly tableau before them stood in horrific beauty, like a scene pulled straight from a kabuki play. The victim's remains were positioned as though she were running and in mid-stride. Galvanized wiring and steel rods held her lifeless body erect. Below her waist, where her legs had once been, were two antique rakes, crudely inserted into the ragged stumps. Agent Lowell sighed and shook his head. This was, undoubtedly, the work of him. So what do we got? Evans asked, entering the barn with a look of disgust in his face. Lowell pulled out a pair of latex gloves and slid them into his hands. He turned to his partner. I was about to have a closer look now, but from a preliminary check over, I think it's him. Evans shook his head in disappointment. Him? You mean the vampire, don't you? Detective Danvers asked as a tone of dread grew in his voice. The agents nodded almost simultaneously, then proceeded to collect evidence from the killer's latest victim. Perfection. There was no other word to describe them. Even the jagged saw marks that graced the severed appendages, like a row of shark's teeth, did not distract from the abject beauty of these trophies. It had taken Dalton Grigsby months to find her, then weeks to memorize her jogging schedule and routes, but he finally had them, the most perfect pair of legs. He parked his van in the little concrete driveway that ran alongside the house he and his late wife had purchased shortly after their wedding. The house stood at the end of a rural dead-end road that backed up to a heavily wooded area. Nearest neighbor had a small farm that was closer to the main road, about two miles away. Dalton didn't mind. He required seclusion for this endeavor. The once quaint brick rancher now slouched in various stages of decay and neglect. From the cracks running through the bricks and foundation to the weather-worn roof with patches of moss and missing shingles, this once promising home now stood as a reflection 
of its sole occupant's mental state, broken, rotted, neglected. He made his way through the worm-eaten front door and proceeded down into the only room of the house he appreciated any more, the cellar. There, in the cool, subterranean dungeon, Dalton had begun what he considered his life's most important work. For well over a year, he'd studied, hunted, subdued, and mutilated five people to complete this masterpiece. But it was more than just art to him. These components, these objects of flesh and bone, would soon be elevated into something so beautiful so magnificent that to behold it would make even the most steadfast person drop to their knees and weep. He created the bloody appendages in his arms like one would a cooing infant, then placed them gently onto his workbench. Dalton reached out with his blood-drenched hands and caressed the two perfect limbs. He knew he would cherish this moment, just as he had cherished the others that came before it groped around under his workstation and retrieved the tools and equipment he required to continue what he now considered his life's only true purpose. These implements he used were nothing fancy. Some galvanized metal wire, rebar, heavy gauge needles, and a suture kit. Once everything was ready and in place, he walked the six short steps from the bench to the display rack where his incomplete masterpiece waited draped in a cloth. With a quick jerk, Dalton ceremoniously removed the covering and tossed it to the ground. He gazed at the magnificence that hung before him as tears welled up in his eyes. He extended a trembling hand toward his beautiful creation while his lips quivered uncontrollably. Soon, he whispered longingly, soon or you will be complete, my darling. Only a few more pieces left. His voice trailed off, his determination and purpose reignited in him. It was time to add those glorious legs to his beloved creation, but first, he must consult the book. Thin trails of smoke danced carelessly from the end of Agent Lowell's cigarette as he poured over his notes and papers from the previous crime scenes. The dim orange glow from the nightstand's lamp washed over the room, casting vague shadows in the walls from the outdated furniture. While I'd grown accustomed to staying in meager accommodations while on assignment, his current dwelling gave the impression it had not been renovated since the mid-70s. Thankfully, he didn't have to stare at too much of the decor. Better part of the dated bedspread was covered in a sea of witness statements crime scene photos. Lowell let out a deep sigh, expelling the smoke from his lungs. All of the evidence left at the scene fit the vampire's M.O., but they were no closer to identifying him, let alone bringing him in. He hated to admit this, but his killer was good at what he did. He knew exactly what to leave to entice the agents, and simultaneously what to take with him to avoid capture. He abducted his victims in one county or city, killed and dismembered them somewhere private, then staged them in an entirely separate location. Whatever tools and implements he used, he brought with him, save for the props he would improvise onto and sometimes into the victim's corpse. He left no prints or hair. Only fluids at the scenes belonged to the victims. He hunted and killed people of different races, ages and genders. Even his choice of trophies changed from killing to killing. The first victim, a 22-year-old white female swimming instructor named Melissa Jarvis, had what could only be described as her torso removed. Everything from her neck down to her pelvis was taken. Victim two, a 43-year-old black male named Jeffrey Shepard, known in the music scene as Big Papa Crown, had his skull, ears, and tongue removed. All other aspects of his head, body, and face were present at the scene.
This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Mint Mobile Phone Service. They say you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, personally, that makes no sense to me. So, you get the cake, but then don't eat it? I understand the point. In layman's terms, they're trying to say that you can't have it all in life. However, with Mint Mobile cellular service, you can. Mint Mobile offers efficient and dependable wireless service for phone as well as internet for an affordable price that even a preteen could afford. I admit that I've seen a difference since I switched. Add the security of being able to reach your child while they're not at home, while helping them feel connected technologically like their peers. What's better is, it's the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, giving your child the responsibility to view and manage their own phone plan. And again, Mint Mobile lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. Let their introduction to the world of bill paying start with an amount that's affordable to earn and maintain, no matter where you live in the United States. More so, with Mint Mobile, you can choose the amount of monthly data that's right for you or your family and stop paying for data that you never use. Switch to Mint Mobile and get better premium wireless service. Again, starting at just 15 bucks a month. Less money on your phone plan saves you more money for other things. Take control of your financial future starting now. Saving money doesn't always have to mean sacrificing or going without. And a new cellular plan doesn't always mean having to shell out hundreds for a new phone. You get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Eighteen-year-old Anna Lau, an Asian-American girl, voted prom queen at Heritage High School, had her face and scalp removed. The fourth victim, a 34-year-old bodybuilder named Hasim Javal, had both arms removed at the shoulders. Last, but certainly not least, the latest victim, identified as 29-year-old Amanda Westfell, had both of her legs removed. Why these parts? Lowell muttered to himself, What are you doing with them? This question had stumbled aimlessly around his mind since the first victim's remains were discovered. Why was he so discerning about what parts he kept from what victims? How was he choosing them? What was his end game? Lowell needed to call it night. He'd been at this for hours since they'd returned from the scene, and he knew they would need to get an early start, questioning the locals and running down leads in the morning. He carefully collected his files and placed them on the armchair next to his bed. With any luck, sleep would find him quickly and he could get some rest before the alarm went off in four hours. Just as his head graced the nearly flat motel pillow, an abrupt knock echoed from the adjoining door that led to his partner's room. Whoa, you still up? Evans asked as he tried the knob before getting a response. Agent Lowell let out a deep sigh, threw off his covers, put on his robe, and unlocked the door for him. Sorry you weren't sleeping, were you? I saw the light under the door and figured I'd see if you were still going over the case. Lowell shook his head and gestured for him to have a seat. Evans moved the papers and files off the chair and placed them on the floor. From the looks of it, he was having a long night as well. Trouble sleeping, Evans? Lowell asked as he offered his sweat-soaked partner a drink, which he graciously accepted. It's just so damn hot. Evans replied, pressing the cool glass of scotch against his forehead. 
isn't it supposed to get cooler when the sun goes down? Lowell chuckled and took a sip of his drink. If Virginia was a desert, sure. But the humidity here traps the heat in. Lowell set his glass down on the nightstand that collected the papers from the floor, returning them to the bed where he had just finished going over them. Well, I don't suppose you came by and to bitch but for hate. What's in your mind? Look, based on what we saw today, there, there's no doubt it's him. But I feel like we're still no closer to catching him than we were when the last victim was found. If he's eating them, he's leaving a lot of stuff behind. If he's disposing of the parts elsewhere, he's doing a damn good job of keeping those locations a secret. If he's keeping them, then we still don't have a motive other than derangement. It appeared the two men were struggling with the same blocks in the case. Lowell had hoped Evans would have found something he didn't, or noticed something that had eluded them from earlier that day. But sadly, this was not the case. The two agents compared notes until the first signs of dawn emblazoned the shades on Lowell's window, and the alarm he had set began to screech from his cell phone. No sleep to be had for either of them. Lowell and Evans got dressed, drank some coffee, and headed out to the parking lot where their rental was waiting. You know, Lowell began, I thought of something. All of the victims we found were good, if not great, at something. All of them had talents or outstanding features. Uh, swimming, rapping, weightlifting, physical beauty... They all had body parts taken relating to their gifts. Going off what was taken from the latest victim, I bet you she was a runner. So you think he's collecting the best parts of the people he murders? Evans responded. How does that help us prevent the next one? What parts do you think he's after next? I don't know, but I feel like his hunting ground is a lot smaller than we originally thought. They may not live near each other, but maybe they share a common link. Lowell pulled out his cell phone and called into the field office. Washburn. Yeah, it's Lowell. Listen, pull up the files on the vampire's victims. I need you to check credit and debit card statements, phone records, and social media. Find out if any of them frequent any of the same places in the last few months leading up to the murders. He hung up the phone and shot Evans a smile. Come on, this may be the break we needed. So, what exactly are we looking for? Evans asked as he, Lowell, and Washburn rigorously poured over bank statements and social media posts belonging to the victims. Any thoughts on what you think links them? Agent Lowell let out a deep sigh. Now, but you had to have seen them all somewhere. While they weren't all from the Richmond area, they were all residents of Virginia. I think he's using out-of-the-way locations to dispose of the remains to give the impression he travels far to find them. But I bid good money he found them all within a 30-minute drive of where he first saw them. They're all in different age groups. They're different races. He's not picky about gender, but something connects them. Agent Washburn removed his wireframe bifocals and gave his temples a firm, then a therapeutic rub. He'd been in the FBI for over 20 years and had worked on everything from sequence killings to human trafficking. While his days in the field were far behind him, he still had the insight and intuition to help on serious cases like the Virginia Vampire. Unfortunately, this was no ordinary case, and the gruesomeness of these killings were more vile and grotesque than the cases that had crossed his desk since he was reassigned to a desk job. This assignment was not by choice. While working in conjunction with local SWAT and narcotics units in Detroit, Washburn had caught a stray bullet. Though his injury wasn't fatal, 
The 9 millimeter round had shattered his right knee. James Brisson, director of the FBI at the time, told him he couldn't remain in the field. Though Washburn insisted he could still function out on assignments, Brisson gave him an ultimatum, desk or retirement. Washburn begrudgingly took the desk job, knowing he could still be of value to the Bureau. So we don't think this one is eating them. Remember that case back in 05? I didn't think that guy was eating them either because of what he took and what he left. But he turned out to be a cannibal. Washburn mused as he monotonously clicked through the social media posts of the deceased. He'd been at it for hours now. Everything from photos to tweets to check-ins to memes. His eyes were beginning to burn and his brain felt fuzzy. He needed a break. I'm going to head down to the commissary and get some good coffee. Either of you want anything? Evan shook his head and continued to scan through bank statements and receipts. Lowell gave no response. He seemed transfixed on something. Evans and Washburn knew he'd found something. Washburn, go back to those photos of Big Papa Crown's album launch party. Evans pulled up the monthly statements of Melissa Jervis. Check specifically for automatic withdrawals like donations or memberships. A look of righteous determination spread across Lowell's face, invigorating his colleagues. He was good like that. They knew once he was on to something, they would find a new lead in the case. Here, Washburn called from his desk. Shepard's album launch party. Looks like they held most of the shindig in the modern art section of VMFA. Lowell turned the screen to get a better look. It was undoubtedly the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. He made it a point to visit when they first arrived in the Richmond area. Why the museum? I took a listen to some of Shepard's music. Doesn't seem like the artsy type to me. You'd be surprised, Washburn. Lowell responded without looking up from the screen. Look here. Lowell continued while pointing at the photos. This painting is in almost every photo. Turns out it was painted by the same artist that did his littlest album cover art. Evans nodded in agreement as he quickly opened a document on his own computer. Look here! Evans shouted excitedly. We may have hit it, Lowell. Melissa Jarvis was a frequent donator and visitor to the VMFA. Her bank statements show monthly donations. As the day went on, more and more connections to the museum revealed themselves. Anna Lau took her senior photos in the museum's sculpture garden. Nassim Jabal worked in the shipping and receiving department of the museum, using his impressive physique to move the heavier shipments the others couldn't. Finally, there was Amanda Westfall, the runner. She attended a VMFA banquet to honor the winners of the Monument Avenue 10K. Washburn, give the VMFA a call. Let them know Evans and I are on the way. Then get in touch with local PD from Richmond, Enrico, and Goochland. And fill them in on what we know. Evans, grab your stuff. Evans quickly gathered his things and followed Lowell out to the car. Think our guy is another museum regular? Evans asked as they hurried through the parking lot. Lowell handed his partner a series of printouts from their computer searches. Notice anything, Evans? Lowell asked as he lit his first cigarette, since the one he smoked last night. See this guy with the camera snapping shots of Shepard from the crowd? Same guy with his phone out in the background with Anna's senior photos. Same guy taking a selfie with Amanda at the banquet. In all of these photos, he's wearing a museum ID badge. He made sure to keep his name out of full view in all of the photos just make out the museum name and insignia. He works there, Evans. Come on, get in the car. It was nearly closing time as Agents Lowell and Evans arrived at the museum. The sound of high school field trips and young children enjoying the youth art programs had faded to the light murmurs and echoing footsteps of the more mature patrons seeking to view the antiquities and masterpieces 
after a long day of work and peace. Evans couldn't help but admire some of the exhibits they passed as they walked toward the information desk. It was never one for museums as a child, but was slowly coming around to them. I wish we had time to look around. Evans whispered to his partner as they approached the desk. Some of this stuff is really fantastic. Lowell sighed and shook his head. Should have come with me when we first got to town. Place is really something. Evans was prepared to retort, but was interrupted. Sorry if I kept you gentlemen waiting. I'm Jeffrey Zelensky, head curator. Any trouble finding us? Zelensky was a slight bespeckled man. His light reddish-brown hair grayed near the temples and tapered down into a white short-cropped beard. Agent Lowell shook his hand and introduced himself and his partner. No, 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 not at all. I actually visited your lovely museum a few weeks ago when we got into town. Mr. Zelensky smiled. He'd been a lover of art since he was just a little boy and always enjoyed hearing praise heaped on the museum. With introductions and pleasantries out of the way, the three men strode through the library and into the curator's private office. So, gentlemen, what can we at the VMFA assist you with? I spoke with an agent Washburn, I believe, yet he gave no indication of what matter of import we'd be discussing. Should I have them close the museum early? Mr. Zelensky was clearly rattled by the FBI needing to speak with him. Not that he had done anything wrong or had anything to hide. He feared this visit would shed unfavorable light on the museum. He'd read the local papers and knew why the two agents were in town, but he refused to believe his museum had anything to do with it. Relax, Mr. Zelensky, Lowell said in a calming tone. There's no need to make your patron slave. Agent Evans and I just have a couple questions and some photos we'd like for you to look at. After that, we should be on our way. The old curator gave an anxious nod, cleared his throat, and gestured to inform the agents he was ready to proceed. Now, Mr. Zelensky, how long have you been here at the VMFA? The curator took a sip of water from the glass on his desk, then let out a steadying sigh. Well, I started here right out of college as a docent while I studied to become a curator. That was about 32 years ago. I've been head curator here the last 20 years, he added with a small hint of pride in his voice. Agents Lowell and Evans made quick notes in their notebooks before proceeding. In that time, did you ever notice anyone acting strangely? Staff, patrons, visitors? The curator shook his head. Agent Evans reached into his briefcase and produced several photos. He carefully placed them on the desk facing Mr. Zelensky. What about this guy? Agent Evans asked, pointing to the man in the selfie with Amanda. Anything noteworthy or peculiar about him? The curator examined the photo more closely, adjusting his glasses on his nose as he did. He shook his head regretfully. No, that's just uh, Dalton Grigsby, Mr. Zelensky began. Good worker. Started out in the shipping and receiving department. Big guy like him helped unload some of the heavier pieces the other workers couldn't handle. Him and Haseem. The two agents looked at each other, then back to Zelensky. Would that be Haseem and Jabal? Agent Lowell queried as he frantically jotted down what the curator had said. Mr. Zelensky nodded nervously. Yes. He stammered. He, uh, he did volunteer work here in the shipping and receiving department. There's nothing on the books about him, but I, I remember him. He was also really strong, bigger than Grigsby. He stopped coming a few months back. I just figured he was finished with his volunteering. Oh, God. He, he was one of the victims, wasn't he? Agent Lowell gave a solemn nod as he saw tears forming in the old man's eyes. The names of the victims had been kept out of the papers, as well as some of the more gruesome details of their deaths. He said Grigsby started out in shipping and receiving. 
Agent Lowell started again after the curator regained his composure. What does he do now? Mr. Solinsky steadied his nerves and removed the pocket square from his jacket to dab away the tears that had streamed down his cheek at the thought of Hasim's demise. Uh, he, uh... Zelensky began after clearing his throat. He works as an exhibit designer now. He has a great eye for detail, and... The old curator paused. His eyes darted back and forth between the two agents. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by Shudder. When it comes to movies, I like them um, scary good. And when I'm in the mood for a thriller or something supernatural, I turn to Shudder, where every week they premiere a new horror movie or series. And we all love things spooky, right? Well, I've got exactly what you're after, a streaming service called Shudder. Shudder is the best place for streaming the movies you love. It has the biggest and fastest growing library of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. For only $5.99 a month or $56.99 per year, you get unlimited access to Shudder's expertly curated collection of horror, thrillers, and suspense. There's a reason they call it the Netflix for horror. If you're a fan of old classics or looking for the next classic, you're going to love Shudder's collection from around the world. They've got favorites like Halloween and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, along with must-see new releases like VHS-94 and Hellbender. Shudder truly has something for everyone. Have an old soul? Let the fear of some good old-fashioned classic horror throw your mind from the comfort of your home, office, or well, anywhere, really. Meaning that, with Shudder, you can stream supernatural, thriller, and horror movies, and TV shows across all your favorite devices. Shudder's streaming library has just about everything, from original movies like Superhost, The Boy Behind the Door, and PG, Psycho Gorman, to the hit series Creep Show by executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. The Shudder series, A Discovery of Witches, aired its last weekly episode toward the end of February, meaning it's fully available for you to binge from start to finish. And as far as movies go, I know I personally fell in love with Slapface, a Shudder original about a grieving boy who deals with the loss of his mother by creating a dangerous relationship with a monster rumored to live in the woods. I decided to check it out due to it being a Cinequest Audience Award winner. Boy, I'll tell you, it did not disappoint. And that's not all. Every week, they add new supernatural terrors, edge-of-your-seat thrillers, and shocking horrors to their already sprawling catalog, jam-packed with both exclusive and original films and series, both classics and blockbuster hits. It's got everything people like us are after. Who doesn't love Crape Show? Imagine how excited I was to hear the executive producer of The Walking Dead was bringing us a new season of Creep Show. Remember the old shows and comic books? Well, now you can have that same horror at your fingertips. Also, did I mention it was ad-free? That's the last thing you need getting in the way of your horror. Shudder has everything supernatural, thriller, and horror. I can't get enough of it. You're going to love it, too. And right now, you can stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free. Go to Shudder.com and use code INTHEDARK, one word. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, code INTHEDARK. Stream free for your first 30 days by going to Shudder.com, code in the dark. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. You don't think Grigsby had anything to do with this, do you? Agents Lowell and Evans 
exchanged an uncomfortable glance at one another. Agent Evans straightened his tie and leaned forward in his chair. Look, this Grigsby guy is in all the photos. And Before he could finish, Lowell interjected. We would just like to talk to him and see if he knew anything about Haseem or any of the other victims. You wouldn't happen to have an address for him, would you? The old curator nodded quickly and began to leave through the Rolodex on the desk. With a look of solemn hesitation, he slowly removed one of the address cards and handed it slowly to Agent Lowell. Thank you very much, Mr. Solinsky, for your cooperation and hospitality. You have a lovely museum here, and I look forward to visiting again, under happier circumstances. Mr. Solinsky gave a weak smile and stood to escort the two agents back through the lobby. As the three men crossed the now entirely deserted museum entryway, a thought came to Agent Lowell. Mr. Zelensky, do you mind showing us what Dalton Grigsby had been working on most recently? The curator, not wanting to refuse the requests of the FBI, led the two agents into the special exhibits wing on the second floor. Outside the roped-off archway leading into the exhibition hall was a large banner that read Art, Science, and the Occult, Paganism's Impact Throughout the Years. The darkened rooms and corridors of the vast marble hall echoed with the footsteps as they entered. Statues of pagan deities, various crumbling books and tomes written in dead and forgotten languages, and paintings of witch sabbaths and occult rituals all sat on display in dimly lit cases or atop pedestals. Agent Evans tried his best not to look at some of the more grotesque pieces as the three of them made their way toward the exhibit Dalton Grigsby had been assigned to work on. Fortunately, as they rounded a sharp corner toward a dimly lit passage, a particularly disturbing painting sat in wait. From a distance, it appeared to be the depiction of a large gathering around a bonfire. However, as the trio drew closer, the ghastly details became easier to discern. For Agent Evans, the bonfire was a large pile of nude, mutilated corpses that had been set ablaze. Men, women, and even small children were present in the heap of decay and desolation. The attendees of the gathering were far more horrific than they had originally seemed as well. Various beings and creatures stood with arms raised above the great death pyre, beings with disproportionate sized limbs and appendages that bent and twisted in undesirable ways, beings with faces that gave only the vaguest impressions of humanity, beings covered in blood and gore of those deemed worthy of the pile. However, the worst of those atrocities stood triumphantly atop a small hill adorned with a crudely hewn stone pulpit near its center. If scale were taken into account, this muscle-bound Goliath would have been nearly ten feet tall. Much like the others in the cobble, this horror stood upright like a man, but its naked form was covered in reptilian-like scales and thick, dark fur. Its face was split from forehead to chin, with a vertical maw lined with teeth and protruding pieces of bone. With one clawed hand it held a torch, the apparent catalyst of the great fire. With the other it pointed menacingly outward at those that dared view this scene. Below the painting was a small beige information plaque that read, The Great Reclamation, Circa. 1100 to 1200 A.D. Tempera paint on animal hide. Artist unknown. Agent Evans was the first to turn away from the painting. The horrifying vista coupled with the vampire case had entwined a knot in his stomach and put ideas in his head that he did not dare put into words. Agent Lowell and Mr. Zelensky studied the painting silently for a moment. Lowell pondered what me the evil mind could have imagined such a scene, while the curator stared at the painting in a mix of disgust and awe. 
Zelensky shook his head and gestured to a small area just across from the macabre scene. The partially completed display consisted of several marble pedestals and glass display cases, some already adorned with sculptures and artifacts dating back to the Roman occupation of Jerusalem. At the very center of the display sat an ancient tome bound in a thick, dark leather of unknown origin. A look of confusion spread across Mr. Zelensky's face. No, 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 this isn't right, he said in a trembling voice, barely above a whisper. Agent Lowell placed a reassuring hand on the curator's shoulder before speaking up. Is everything all right, Mr. Zelensky? Is there something wrong with the display? The curator nodded, and with a shaking hand, pointed to the leather-bound book that seemed to be the focal point of the exhibit. This is not the right book. This is the Liber Anarerum. The book that is supposed to be here is the Liber Sacri Redis. Agent Evans gave his partner a concerned look before chiming in. Is there any way this is a simple mistake? And Grigsby grabbed the wrong book by mistake. Again, the curator shook his head. No. Dalton has seen both books before. He even did the exhibit this book belongs in. Agents Lowell and Evans jotted down the names of the books, and the three men quickly made their way back to the main lobby. Thank you very much for your time and cooperation, Mr. Zelensky. We're going to swing by Grigsby's house and question him about the missing book and what he knows about Hassim and the others. The old curator swallowed hard. Agent Lowell, he began, you, you don't think he really committed those murders, do you? We just need to ask him some questions. Nothing is concrete yet, and as soon as we rule him out, the better. With that, the two agents sped off in the night toward the home of Dalton Grigsby. It was just after midnight when the two agents parked their car across the street from Grigsby's house. The road was nearly vacant, save for one or two bats that flapped their wings and screeched in the jet-black night, hunting for prey. Agents Lowell and Evans strode carefully through the overgrown crabgrass and weeds that comprised the majority of the front yard before reaching the front stoop. Without hesitation, Agent Lowell gave three quick pounds on the aged door. The echo from his knocks was the only response to greet them. Apart from the van parked in the driveway, the house seemed completely deserted. After waiting for almost a minute, Agent Lowell repeated his knocks. It wasn't long before the sound of footsteps could be heard moving through the decrepit domicile, growing louder as they neared the front door. With a loud click, the porch light illuminated, casting the agents in an unnatural ochre glow. Hello? A low, tired voice called out from the other side of the door. Who is it? Agent Lowell cleared his throat. Good evening, Mr. Grigsby. We're sorry to disturb you at such a late hour. I'm Special Agent Lowell, and this is my partner, Special Agent Evans. We'd like to speak with you about the museum you work for. It appears something's gone missing. Only silence answered them for what felt like an eternity before the door slowly creaked open. Before them stood a man in his late thirties. He was average height, but even the loose-fitting jeans and black t-shirt he'd thrown on to answer the door could not hide the muscles that must have taken him years of training to pack on. Dalton pushed his long black hair out of his face and rubbed the last traces of sleep from his eyes. Would you gentlemen like to come in? I can put some coffee on if you like. The agents accepted the invitation and followed him through the front sitting room and into the kitchen. Much like the rest of the house, the kitchen was in dire need of renovation. The paint chipped and cracked in various places revealing the color the walls had originally worn. The wallpaper was torn and peeled away in places, as if someone once had the idea to change it, but gave up. All of the appliances were outdated and could do with some cleaning. Oil and grease stains 
covered the stove's flat top and the surrounding counters. Dalton started the coffee maker, then took a seat across from the two agents at a small round dinette table in the center of the kitchen. Mr. Grigsby, Agent Lowell began, while pulling out several folders from his briefcase, were you aware that one of the artifacts from your exhibit had gone missing? Dalton gave out a deep sigh and solemnly shook his head. No, he lied while looking at Agent Lowell in the eyes. Last I checked, everything was where it should be. Do you mind telling me what's gone missing? Agent Evans took out his notepad and tried his best to pronounce the name of the stolen book. The Liber Sacri Redis? Mr. Zelensky said another book had been put in its place. A book belonging to another exhibit you'd worked on not long before this one. A look of annoyance spread across Grigsby's face. You think I stole it, don't you? His voice was flat and nearly robotic in its delivery. What can you tell us about Asim Jabal? Mr. Zelensky said you and he worked together briefly. He hasn't been at work for a long time. Do you think he had anything to do with the missing book? A sardonic smile spread across Dalton's face. Asim? whispered Grigsby with a sense of longing in his voice. Ah, oh, I remember her, Seem. He had the most amazing physique. I once thought about asking him to train me at the gym, but I, I was too shy. I mean, did you see the arms on this guy? Evan shot Lowell a worried glance. A high-pitched beeping noise began to sound off from the coffee maker on the counter behind Grigsby, but he ignored it his eyes fixed on the photos in front of him. Agent Evans slowly reached for the gun in his holster so as not to draw attention from the reminiscing man across the table. Don't bother, Grigsby said calmly, without even turning his attention to Evans. In those next moments, several things happened in rapid succession. Both agents drew their sidearms. Grigsby flipped the table toward them, shut off the kitchen light and darted toward the door that led into his cellar. Evans! Agent Lowell shouted through the darkness, gun still drawn and at the ready. Do you have eyes on Grigsby? Agent Lowell groped the walls until his fingers found the light switch. With the lights back on, the two agents scanned the room for the missing suspect. I heard a door open near the living room. I think he ran into the cellar. Evans replied as sweat began to drip down his forehead. Adrenaline coursed through his body as the thought finally came to him. We found him. Okay, Evans, listen. Agent Lowell whispered to his partner. We'll secure the living room and front door while I call this in so we can get some backup out here. The agent's words were suddenly cut short by several blasts from a shotgun that penetrated through the floor beneath them. Agent Evans returned fire blindly into the deteriorating floorboards, hoping to end this situation as quickly as possible. After exchanging several volleys, the gunfire from the cellar finally ceased. There was the sound of a shotgun clattering to the ground and the thud of a body slumping onto the floor. Agent Lowell let out a deep sigh. He and his partner were not hit by any of the Grigsby shots. He caught his breath and turned to Evans. Okay, let's, let's call it in and sweep the house. I think whatever he was doing with his trophies, he was doing here. It's quiet, isolated, and unassuming. Agent Lowell reached for his radio to call in for backup. His hand had barely grasped the receiver when a loud bang erupted from the cellar just beneath his feet. Buckshot and wooden shrapnel pierced through the bottom of his feet and calves. With that final assault, the floor gave way and crashed into the cellar below. Agent Lowell hit hard on the dusty concrete floor below with his partner landing close by. Grigsby was nowhere to be seen. Lowell, Lowell, Evans shouted. Did he get you? Are you okay? Agent Lowell gave no response. Blood loss from the ragged flesh that once composed the lower portions of his legs and the sudden fall through the floor it stunned the veteran agent. Oh my God, Lowell, I'm going to call for help. We're going to get out of here. 
Evans fumbled for his radio when the sound of a cocking shotgun behind him shattered the silence. I wouldn't if I were you. Gregsby threatened in a controlled tone. Don't worry, Agent Evans. You have the great privilege of witnessing what comes next. Unfortunately, until my work here is complete, I must devote my undivided attention to the tasks at hand. With that, Grigsby slammed the butt of the shotgun into the back of Agent Evans' head. Evans felt the room spin, then his vision blurred, then it went dark. Then there was nothingness. Terrible, empty nothingness. Agent Evans! Evans! You awake? A muffled voice called to him from across the tenebrous cellar. His skull throbbed from a searing pain that radiated from the bloody impact point at the rear of his head to just behind his eyes. Full consciousness had not yet returned to him, however. Even in this fog nightmare, he knew it was Grigsby that called out to him. He tried to shake off the daze and return to his feet, but it was no use. If the weakness and tremors were not enough to keep him slumped onto the floor, then the ropes and duct tape surely were. He struggled only for a moment before realizing it was futile and consigned himself to conserving his energy in the off chance a backup call had gone out prior to the floor collapsing. As his senses returned, Agent Evans became suddenly aware of the putrid smells assaulting his nostrils from an area of the room unaffected by the sudden cave-in from the firefight. His eyes had still not fully adjusted to the dark, but he could see what he assumed was Grigsby working at either a workbench or table. In the far right corner stood a massive object covered by a cloth. The sound of Grigsby's tool ceased as his imposing figure turned to face him. He approached with slow, heavy footsteps, then crouched to meet his gaze. Oh, finally awake, I see. Good. I really didn't want you to miss this. His deep voice, tinged with a hint of excitement, echoed through what remained of his workshop. I am sorry I wasn't a better host to you and Agent Lowell. If you two hadn't brought up his seam so early in the conversation, we could have at least enjoyed our coffee. Well, that doesn't matter anymore, does it? I mean, I think the time for pretense has come to an end. Besides, I don't believe Agent Lowell is in any real position to drink anything. Evans felt his heart sink. He struggled to move once again but he still couldn't break the binds that held him in place. Grigsby, where's Agent Lowell? What have you done? His questions fell on deaf ears. Gregsby gave him a calm smile, patted him on the cheek, then returned to his workstation. Call for backup, Grigsby. They'll be here any minute. Don't make this any worse than it has to be. Let me out of here and we can talk. The lies that spewed from his mouth only elicited an amused chuckle from his captor. <laughs> Back up? Well, someone should tell them they're running very late. See, you've been unconscious for hours. Look around you, Evans. I have no close neighbors. No street lights on this road. Hell, did you hear even a dog bark after all that gunfire? No. I'm afraid it's just the three of us. A small feeling of relief washed over Evans. He said three. Maybe Lowell was still alive and just unconscious. I'm not a cannibal, you know, Gregsby explained. Far from it. I loved those people. Well, I loved parts of them. I spent years working at the museum, surrounded by gorgeous paintings and antiquities. But beautiful as they are, something was missing. Then I saw it. I believe you saw it, too. The Great Reclamation. Agent Evans shuddered at the mere thought of that painting. Oh, you didn't like it. Sadly, everyone's a critic these days. What you might have thought grotesque, I saw true beauty. 
Why do you think I took the parts that I did? Imagine a being with the best legs, the strongest arms, the prettiest face, all combined into one ideal human. You know, I used to think my wife was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I was so wrong. Again, I am glad you are here to witness this. This will be the greatest discovery in modern science, coupled with true art and form. I'm truly sorry that you have nothing to contribute to my masterpiece. Your partner, on the other hand, gave me some truly invaluable materials. I just knew he'd be the perfect fit for my work. Now, after you've told me what you really think of my work, I suppose I can use you for concept art, a sketch, if you will. Grigsby snapped on the overhead lights that had not been damaged by the debris. He carefully adjusted them so their beams fell on the bloodstained cover, draped on a thing in the corner. He turned his attention once more to the subdued agent. May I present to you Ideal beauty, mixed medium. In one quick motion, Gregsby drew back the sheet, revealing the culmination of all of his work. There it hung, in all of its grotesqueness and morbidity. The trim torso of the young swim instructor, Melissa Jarvis, connected to the muscular arms of Hasim Jabal and the toned legs of Amanda Westfell. Above the neck were the skull and ears of Big Papa Crown, with Anna Lau's face and scalp stretched and stapled to fit the much larger bone structure. Agent Evans wretched at the sight of this abomination. This amalgamation of limbs and body parts was reminiscent of those things that cheered and bayed around the pile of mutilated bodies in that abhorred painting. Gregsby shot Agent Evans a disappointed glance. Look, I understand that art is subjective, but how could you deny its magnificence? Well, maybe this next part will change your mind, give you a new perspective and a true appreciation for my craft. Dalton Gregsby returned to his work table and retrieved an ancient-looking book bound in dark leather. Though he had never seen it before, Evans knew this was the missing copy of the Liber Sacri Ritus. Gregsby opened the tome to a page he had carefully marked and began to chant in some otherworldly language. The shouts and screams of his blaspheming grew as it amplified by some unseen choir. The overhead lights flickered and buzzed with each syllable as if they would soon explode. The foundation quaked and rumbled beneath them as Grigsby finished his incantation. With one final utterance, the horrid creature that once hung motionless began to convulse and shake on its mountings. The ill-fitting body parts writhed and twitched as the sutures and wiring holding them in place strained and pulled in every direction. Its mouth fell open with a disgusting snap, issuing an unearthly howl of pain and terror. Evans closed his eyes as tightly as possible. He could not bear to see this impossible thing, defy all earthly logic and reanimate. Uh, Evans? An unfamiliar voice called to him from across the cellar. Agent Evans slowly opened his eyes. The monstrosity gazed at him with an all-too-familiar look, a look that Evans had come to know over the past few years. The monster's steely blue eyes started to well up with tears as it wailed and raged in that subterranean hell. Gregsby began to laugh hysterically, his head down on the bloody work table before him. It was that telling laughter and what he saw next that finally splintered what remained of Agent Evans' sanity, sending him into fits of screams and cries for help. On the wall, just next to where the creature hung, was the body of his partner, Agent Lowell, his eyes and brain neatly removed from his skull.
I hope you enjoyed Ideal Beauty by J.M. Smano, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash J.M. Samano. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash J dash M dash C-E-N-N-A-M-O. While he's now returning to the world of horror, you don't have to go very far to read something terrifying from him. He's one of the 30 authors who graced the pages of the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Anthology Volume 1, where he spins a tale, rash decisions, and unpleasant encounters. The book's available in print from Amazon now, and soon in ebook and audiobook formats. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave JM a kind word and let him know you heard about him on this show and that Otis sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012. All of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors, Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, 
Subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode, and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> ha 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 ha